Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your blessings. Father, this morning as we are here worshiping, help us to know that you love us, that you care for us, and to be thankful for everything you've done. Father, be with the gift and the giver this morning. Be with those um, monies that we take in, Lord. Uh, may we be wise stewards of those and continue to build your kingdom here in Bada. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Living God, we only want to hear your voice. 
hearts are heavy this morning with the Bird family and with the Antioch Church. And Brother, we just lift up Sheila and the family today. We lift up that congregation and the Hispanic congregation as they worship today and they gather. We celebrated the life yesterday of a wonderful man, a wonderful pastor. And, and we know that he is celebrating with you this morning. But hearts are heavy and hearts are hurting this morning. So we just ask for your comfort. We ask for your peace and your loving arms to wrap around each and every one of them this morning. Those of our family, Father, that are hurting, for whatever reason, we ask, Father, for your comfort and your peace and your presence to be with them as well. Without you, we're nothing. Without you, we can do nothing. Increase our faith today. Even increase our desire to to be more like you. And as we've sung, Spirit of the Living God, we only want to hear your voice. May that be the prayer of each and every one here this morning. We don't want to listen and hear any other voices. We just want to hear your voice. We need to hear from you. Change us, Father, as we listen. Give us strength to make the changes. Not to, to live in fear, but to live in joy. To live joyous each day. Even yesterday, Father, as we celebrated Pastor Don, there was still joy. Even in the midst of trouble, in the midst of concerns, in the midst of not understanding, in the midst of not knowing, we can still have joy. Give us understanding, Father. Give us clear pathways of your leading. Give us clear direction where the waters might be muddled a little bit. Thank you that we have a beautiful day. Kind of makes all the gloom go away and thank you that we have an opportunity to come this morning and to worship together in your house. Be with each and every one that's here today that has come out and may they sense a new touch from you just because they're here. May they sense a new your part in their life. <clears throat> May you be number one in each of our lives. Nothing else matters. And as we've been reminded this week, in the twinkling of an eye, we can be gone. So may each of us be able to say, God is number one in my life. 
God is the one who leads and directs me. Be with Pastor as he brings to us this morning the message you've laid on his heart. Give us ears again to hear your voice through him. We've heard you speak to us through the music this morning. Now may we hear your voice in the scriptures, in the message you laid on his heart. But may we not just hear it, but may we do something with it. May we be even more willing than ever before to be your hands and your feet, to be your voice. Because all around us, we know of people who don't know you. So give us opportunities and open doors for us to share who you are and to share you with others. Be with those that will be listening to us as they listen to video and those that are shut in we pray that you continue to be with Mark Young Father as he recuperates just give him strength to continue to do his everyday work but also Father would this be a time that he could really turn his life around and turn towards you to give him the touch that he needs. We love you, Father. So much to be thankful for as your children. And we pray that this morning as we continue, may we do so with thankful hearts and open hearts and open minds. And in everything that we do today, through the whole day, would it be to glorify your name, to give you praise, and to give you honor. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, 
give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all of those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said this to his host. When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends and your brothers or sisters, your relatives and all your rich neighbors, all of them, all of our Because if you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot pay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Yes. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. Before you seat down, before you seat down, before you take your seat, <laughs> let's recite our motto together once again. Would you please at least say it together? Heavenly Father, I give you permission to speak to me, to speak through me, to do whatever you want with my life. I trust the leadership of your Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you really believe that, you can sit down. <laughs> well, if they all reverse that on you, you might be surprised. <laughs> Listen. Well, some of you might remember the name Howard K. Smith. Anybody remember him? There's a few of oh, them. Where's really? Two of you remember Howard K. Smith, the journalist, and the TV. And you might also remember that he was the co anchor of the ABC Evening News along with Barbara Walters. Anybody remember her? Back in the 60s and 70s. That was way before my time. <laughs> <laughs> but in his uh, in his post as a network analyst, Howard Smith had the opportunity to interview some of our uh, uh, society's most fascinating people, as well as various presidents. In fact, later later on, after he got that started, he was known for that kind of heading the election you know, that took place uh, along the way. In our, in our country, but in spite of having a job that most of us would consider high status, he complained that his children never considered him very hip, as they used to say. <laughs> in fact, he said they seemed completely underwhelmed by anything the old man did. He said no matter how many autographs he collected from them, no, no matter how many famous names he dropped or pictures he showed them, his kids still didn't think he was anything special. And then came the presidential conventions. When he first started into the presidential conventions in 1964, and uh, Howard Smith, they sent him out to, to San Francisco to cover those conventions for ABC. And his, his family joined him later for a tour of California's Highlights, which included a visit to the brand new amusement park, Disneyland, was just in town. And his kids were so excited at the prospect of running into their idol, their hero, Mickey Mouse. They couldn't wait to meet Mickey Mouse. He said the family spent all day riding all the rides and sampling all the various snacks and foods. And then as they wandered through the park, they happened upon their hero himself, Mickey Mouse. And suddenly this life-size rodent stared in surprise and exclaimed in his loud, squeaky voice, It's Howard K. Smith! <laughs> Smith said that his kids stood there in amazement. His daughter, little daughter Catherine, suddenly looked at him with new admiration and respect. Her dad had been recognized by Mickey Mouse <laughs> and raised his stature considerably in her eyes. <laughs> Smith glowed, he said, just glowed in, the, in his face with this newfound status that he had. But as he reflected on that incident, he realized it was really frivolous <laughs> to, to uh, 
you know, basis standing on the words of a cartoon mouse. And he said after that, status didn't really mean all that much to Howard Smith. Instead, he said he, he focused on living an upright life and no longer caring what other people He's more concerned about what his job thought about him and what his family thought. Well, I tell you that story because it just reminds us that we all like to be recognized, don't we? Even if it is only by Mickey Mouse. We all want to be recognized. It's one of the most human of desires, I think. We all want we all want to be somebody, right? We all want to be that person. In fact, Bernie Madoff certainly did. Do you remember that name, Bernie Madoff, a few years ago? You remember he uh, operated the largest Ponzi scheme in world history? Through his uh, scheme, he committed the largest financial fraud in U.S. history. Prosecutors... Uh, Estimated the size of the fraud to be nearly $65 billion. That's what it be. Billion dollars. $65 billion fraud. That was based on the amounts that, that were in all the accounts of uh, Bernie Madoff's 4,800 some clients. And as of uh, November 30th, 2008, when they calculated that, but when he was exposed, it all came crumbling down. He lost everything dear to him. A son committed suicide. His family, his friends turned their backs on him. He was stripped of all his wealth, his yachts, his private jet, his homes and exotic locations, just everything that gave him a sense of place in the world was lost. And then on June 29, 2009, at the age of 71, Bernie Madoff, the man who seemingly had it all, was sentenced to 150 years in prison. The maximum that the law would allow. And it just kind of makes us wonder, and a lot of people did, in fact. It makes us wonder, why, why did he do it? Why did he do it? And obviously, greed played a role, but... That wasn't the key factor. In fact, according to one, one biographer, Bernie Madoff's driving motivation was to gain recognition. He wanted to be somebody. They said that as a young person, Bernie never stood out. He, he wasn't smart enough in school. He wasn't athletic enough. Wasn't handsome enough. Not, art, not articulate enough. He was rejected by one girl after another. He, he was a nobody as far as his standards of human worth were concerned. He seemed to only have one gift. He was excellent at making money, especially other people's money. He used that gift to obtain the recognition he so desired. Unfortunately, it was not the kind of recognition anyone would want. The recognition of committing the, the world's largest case of fraud destroyed him and destroyed many of those around him. But wondering what in the world would make a person do something. And to find out that his driving motivation was to gain recognition, to be somebody. And my guess is that down deep, most people long to be somebody. If we were to go throughout this room and talk to you and talk very seriously about what really is your desire, a lot of us, it would come out, we really want to be somebody. Jesus understood that. Jesus was the master psychologist, and he knew that all of us crave recognition, and he knew that the desire for status is an innate part of the human condition. He knew that. He knew that most of us don't want to just keep up with the Joneses. We want to be slightly ahead of the Joneses, right? Or the Smiths or whoever else is on the block. We just want to be slightly ahead of them, right? 
it, it's, a, it's very human to want to be one up on our friends. And that's why we have trash talk. That's why, you know, we just, you know, that's why, you know, when I saw everybody else getting new I had to go get a Prius. <laughs> <laughs> One up, I gotta get one up, especially over ten days. I gotta get one up. <laughs> Man, it was, it's interesting though because there was there was a Harvard University of Harvard study that I read not too long ago, where they asked the students if prices were the same, which option would you choose? Option A is you make fifty thousand dollars a year and everybody else makes twenty five thousand dollars a year, or option B. You can make $100,000 a year and everybody else will make $200,000. Option A, you make 50, everybody else makes 25. Option B, you make 100,000, everybody else makes 200,000. And which option do you think they chose? Those Harvard students, they chose option A. They'd rather make $50,000 and everybody else make 25. Rather than them making $100,000 and everybody else making it. I just, it, it just kind of says something about human nature, doesn't it? It's a stark reminder for us. That status is at least as powerful a motivator as money. Status is at least as powerful a motivator as money. And it's still true. It's true today. It, it was true 2,000 years ago. Jesus knew that and he saw an opportunity to use that very natural craving for recognition to teach us some very useful lessons. One Sabbath, as the scripture says, Jesus went to eat in the house of this prominent Pharisee. And when, when he noticed how the guest picked the places of honor at the table, he told them a most very interesting parable. Look at it again. Chapter 14 of Luke, verse 8. He said, When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited if so, the host who has invited you, or both of you, will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, they'll say to you, friend, move up to a better place. And then you'll be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Isn't that a whimsical bit of wisdom? I, I can almost see the smile on Jesus' face as he's, as he's telling them this. But you see, in Jesus' day, money wasn't the primary motivating factor in people's lives. The dominant value was prestige. So money wasn't the driving force in that day. Prestige was the value of the day. So, Dinner parties were planned according to the social status of the guests. Everyone had an established place on the social ladder. Everyone had an established place. The, the guest list was, was very important. It was, it was important that family members and community leaders, everybody would be honored. And they had a certain place that they sat. Where you sat at dinner revealed your status. In the community. And so at a, at a formal banquet, it would be absolutely humiliating to be asked to move to the foot of the table. I mean, obviously, every, every culture has its pecking order, right? <laughs> it, it, it's silly, of course, we, we know, but, but it's very important to some people. I, I'm, I'm reminded of an answer that, that uh, Baron Rothschild once gave when he was asked about seating important guests, <laughs> his answer was this. He said, those that matter 
won't mind where they sit, and those who do mind. <coughs> Those that matter where they sit won't mind where they sit. And those who do mind, they don't really matter. So obviously, Jesus wasn't really interested in helping his disciples win at the status game. Because he knew, however, how potent this drive is to be number one. He knew how potent that drive was. And you can ask any employer Ask any employer what is the most important motivator of employees besides money, and they will say recognition. Besides money, recognition. <laughs> the story told of a, a woman who had worked hard raising a family with little appreciation from the family, and so one evening the husband, or she asked her husband, she said, I, I suppose, Peter, that if I should die, you would spend a large amount for flowers for me, wouldn't you? Well, of course I would, Martha, he said. Why in the world would you ask? She said, I was just thinking that those expensive flowers and those expensive wreaths would mean nothing to me then. But just one little flower from time to time while I am living would mean so much to me. Got quiet, didn't it? <laughs> you men are like, hmm. <laughs> we all want to be recognized. We all want to be appreciated. <coughs> right? Yes. You, it's okay if you say, no, 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 no. If you want to disagree with me, it's okay. I, I know I'm right, but I just want to make sure you <laughs> We all want to be recognized. We all want to be appreciated. Jesus understood that. And so, he gave his disciples this little whimsical bit of advice about taking a secondary seat so that you might be moved up to a greater seat. And Jesus followed this very special lesson with another lesson right on the heels of it. Look at, pick it up in verse 12. Luke's Gospel chapter 14. Pick it up in verse 12. Turning to the host of the banquet, Jesus said, when, when you give a luncheon or dinner, don't invite your friends and your brothers or sisters and your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you get repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? This is, this is a much less probable scenario, but also a much more serious one. You see, Jesus is giving us a lesson about how to make our life really count. He's giving us a lesson about how to make our life really count. If you really want to make your life count, you won't do it by playing the silly games of status and recognition. That's for, we used to say that's for the highfalutin folks. But I've met some folks who weren't very highfalutin who still had thought they were better than other people, right? We, we all know. So it's about attitude. But that, that's another story. If you really want to make your life count, you won't do it by playing the silly games of status and recognition. You'll quit worrying about what kind of car you drive or wearing the latest fashions or even how spacious and nice your house is. No, the driving force in your life will be serving Christ and making the world better for the people in your world. That's the driving force. Author and pastor Tony Campolo, who I refer to quite a bit, you, you notice, but he, he tells a story of, a, of an experience he had at a, a dinner in Port Prince, Haiti, 
some years ago. He was checking on mission programs that his organization, organization carries out day in and day out. Got out in the and he wanted to see how the workers were surviving emotionally and spiritually and so forth. So at the end of a long day, he was tarred and, and peopled out, he says. And so it was with great relief that he sat down to eat a good dinner at a French restaurant right in the heart of port au -Prince. He was seated next to uh, the window so he could enjoy watching the activity on the street outside. The waiter brought in his delicious looking meal and set it down in front of him. And Tony picked up his knife and fork and he was about to dive in when he happened to look to his right. And there with their noses pressed flat against the window, staring at his plate of food, were four children from the street. They pressed their faces right up against the glass. They, they were staring at his plate of food. The waiter, seeing his discomfort, quickly moved in and pulled down the window shade, shutting out the disturbing side of the hungry children. children. And, and the waiter said to Dr. Kimbolo, he said, don't let them bother you. Just enjoy your meal. Well, if you know anything about it, Tony Campbell, you know that enjoying his meal under such circumstances would be far from his mind. Because of his love for Christ, Tony Campbell has a passion for helping the forgotten children of this world. And if he can find a way to help, he will. And he does. His experience reminds me of a story told by another pastor who I don't have a name for. But it seems that a layman in, in a church in one of the most rundown sections of the inner city of a large urban area found, found his newly appointed pastor standing at his study window overlooking the city, weeping as he looked out over the tragic conditions of their city. The layman tried to console him and said, Pastor, don't worry, after you've been here a while, you'll get used to it. And the pastor turned and looked and he said, Yes, I know, and that's why I cry. You see, may God help us. May God help us if our hearts ever harden to the conditions in which many people find themselves. It might be, it might be children with no one to look after them except a drug-addicted mother. It might be an elderly man or woman who has just lost a spouse. It might be a young woman with a newly discovered tumor in her breast. It might be a neighbor who has recently lost their job. The number, the number of people who are dealing with heart-rending issues are many. May God help us if we simply pull down the curtain and ignore their needs. Jesus is giving us a lesson about how to make our lives really count. It's not whether you sit at the head table. It's not whether the maitre d' at the finest restaurant in town knows you by name. It's where you sit at the final banquet table that Christ has prepared for all of his saints. Amen. That's what matters. Those places are, are reserved for people with hearts who are willing to do more than give sympathetic nods to those who are hurting, but will offer a sympathetic hand to help as well. So it's not whether you sit at the head table. It's where you sit at the final banquet table. There's an old story about a young boy who maybe you've heard before, so I'm sorry, but it, it helps drive home this point. It, the, the, the old story about the young boy who, on an errand for his mother, had just bought a dozen eggs. And walking out of the store, he tripped and dropped the sack, and all the eggs broke, and the sidewalk was a mess. The boy was trying not to cry. A few people gathered around to see if he was okay and to tell him how sorry they were and to offer their condolences. And in the midst of all the words of pity, one man handed the boy a quarter. And then he turned to the group and said, 
I care 25 cents worth. How much do the rest of you care? I care 25 cents worth. How much do the rest of you care? You see, Jesus said, when you give a luncheon or dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. Because if you do, they, they'll probably invite you back. You'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they can't repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. You see, we don't have to worry about keeping records. We don't have to worry about keeping score because our Father in Heaven, He's got to take care of us. Yeah, He does. He has to take care of us. He knows exactly what we're doing with what we've got. You see, in the long run of things, it doesn't matter if the cartoon character at the amusement park recognizes you or even if the president of the country recognizes you. It doesn't matter in the long run of things. But when the final day comes, will God recognize you? That's what really matters. I couldn't help but think about my sermon yesterday when we were at the service for Pastor Don Bird. And a lot of things I didn't really, really know about Don until yesterday that came out. Even though I've been a fellow pastor with him for the last 23 years here on this district. And they, all the pastors that were there lined up, I mean, who can do Lined up to have like a, an honor of guard for, in respect for Pastor Don and the family. And different ones that spoke and talked about how he recognized them. And they had letters and people that had written in and talked about how. Pastor Don recognized them, helped them along the way, encouraged them. And that a lot of people knew Don Hurd. But as we as we were watching the casket leave the, the sanctuary yesterday, I couldn't help but think to myself, all these people who know Don. But the most important is that God recognizes him. Amen. He knows him. And has a place ready for him. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, if I know Don like I think I know Don, I think he would be, he would be more pleased about that than about everybody giving him all the food wrong. And the accolades. And it just causes me to ask us and to be aware of our condition. That when it's all said and done, no matter who we know or who we think we know or who knows us and how many people know us. Because I'm sure this building will hold plenty when my time comes. I to compare to what Don is, I was telling us oh, wow, it just kind of blowed me away to think about those folks who knew Don and Don touched their lives. But am I known by God? We sang the song earlier, He knows my name. He sees each tear that falls. He knows. He knows you. By name. If he knows you by name whenever you're out away from this place, when you're out doing living your life your regular 
your own life. Does God recognize you out there? Or is he ashamed? How am I living my life? How do I treat others? How, do, how does that happen? This lesson that Jesus teaches us. Not about my status or the special recognition that people may give. But it's all about being recognized by God. Because that's what matters in the end. Amen? Amen. This is the first Sunday of the month, and it's time for our communion together. What a wonderful time to be able to celebrate communion. To know that even before, before we existed, God sent His own Son into the world because He cared about us. And He sent His own Son to, and gave His own life's blood and broke his own body so that you and I could have life now and that we could have it more abundantly eternally. He's with us. If our servers will come. As is our custom, you don't have to be a member here. We invite you at the, at the Lord's table to partake. And so as the elements are passed, Take the flavor and the cup. And after everyone, just hold on to it after you receive it. After everyone has received it, then we will partake together and we will let you know what that is.
Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to you. My one supreme desire is to be recognized by Him. Not just on the day of recognition, the day of judgment, but every day of my life to be recognized by Him. On the night Jesus had His supper with His disciples, He was with them in the upper room. And he took the bread and He blessed it and He broke it and He passed it around the table to His disciples. And he told the disciples that this bread was just a symbol of His broken body. That someday, they would be made complete. They would be made whole. Be made well. And he told his disciples that as often as they would eat this bread, that they would remember him. And that's why we do it. That's why we're here. So today, let's eat to our soul's content. Jesus took the cup. He said to his disciples that this cup is also a symbol, a symbol of the new covenant that he's making with them. And the new covenant also um, involves his blood. His blood that would be spilled, his blood that would be shed for not only the remission of sins, but to make them clean pure, holy. And as often as they would drink it, he said, remember me. So today, we do. Let's drink. And let's pray together. Thank you today. I thank you for for not forsaking us when we turn to you in prayer. We thank you for our daily bread and for the opportunity to partake of this bread of communion this morning. We remember Jesus and what his supper meant to those called to suddenly to continue his ministry. You recognized them that day. Lord, I pray that you would recognize us today. We, we need your presence if we're to continue in that ministry today. So Lord, bless our commitment to greater Christian service. And also we seek your truth as we give thanks for this cup of communion, knowing how often we fall short of your will in our lives. And in, that in receiving the cup, we remember your Son, our Savior, and his, his redemptive power. Fill us with your Spirit, I pray, O Lord, that, that with new awareness we might dedicate to you the days and the weeks ahead and Ask for your guiding Holy Spirit in what we think, say, and do. So that we would not only be recognized by you at that final day, but we would be recognized by you every day of our lives and that you would not be ashamed of the way we live our life. We want to live pleasing to you. Oh God, we're, we're such creatures of habit. The rhythm of life is so reliable and we, we grow so accustomed to calm dependability and routine. And so we confess this morning that we're, we're not entirely prepared to handle the disruption that your presence among us promises always to create. Remind us, Lord, whose place this is and whose people we are that, that we did not call you here, you call us. That we have no business being here except you set the agenda. 
So take command then, holy guide of life and fortune, and, and let the busy, the business of this day, your business, now begin in earnest to carry us where you want us. For Lord, we want to be recognized by you. Down deep in our very souls, we, we know, oh God, that, that there's no forgiveness apart from repentance. And there's no reconciliation without sacrifice. There's no resurrection except we submit to the death of our own selves so that we might be raised with Christ. But it's so hard. We, we loathe the press of the cross and we dread the veil of death's shadow. With the facility of the a well rehearsed, we, we make excuses, we postpone the appointment, we beg for time. And yet, even as we resist, we, we apprehend your coming mercy that penetrates our soul's murk and, and promises the healing for which we long for. And frightened, frightened by the surgery our restoration requires, we yet come trembling before you this morning, O Lord. You're the physician of the human soul and we plead to you to heal us. Remove from us the burden of sin. Excise our self-deception. And with all, give us your peace. We bring our gifts to your table, Lord. The same table from which we receive the bread and the cup that symbolize your tangible love for real people in real need and in real pain. Through these elements, let some of your children experience in a form that they can touch and taste the bread and cup of your love and grace. May we know that we are known by you and that we have received your grace of forgiveness and your mercy of love and your presence to face the unknowns of what might lie ahead for us on our journey of faith. And that includes this week. Go with us. This I humbly ask through the name and the power of the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Amen. Would you stand up please receive the benediction. So now, may you know that He knows you by name and knows your every step. He is with you always. May God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. And may God's countenance be lifted upon us. And give us peace. And may the peace of Christ be with you all. Thank you. You are dismissed.